Last week, we talked about Paul and his Christ-colored lenses. As Paul looked at the world around him, when he was looking through his Christ-colored lenses, it changed the way he saw everything. It changed the way he saw his imprisonment in Rome to the point where it didn't matter whether he lived or whether he died. What mattered was that he would give Christ the glory in his life or in his death. Either way, he was a winner. To live was Christ and to die was even more Christ. The only other thing that really mattered was that Christ was glorified. And that's what he was concerned about back at Philippi. He was concerned that the believers there were also wearing their Christ-colored glasses and were living lives that brought glory to Christ. In chapter 4 of Paul's letter, if you skip ahead, you'll see that Paul addresses two ladies in the congregation at Corinth, or I'm sorry, at Philippi, who were in a fight. There was a disagreement between the two ladies, and even though Paul does not get into the nature of the disagreement, what they were arguing about, it, it must have been such a squabble that Paul heard about it thousands of miles away in Rome. Paul calls out these two ladies by name. Their names were Oida, and Synecdoche. He calls them out by name in his letter because they were giving Christ a bad name. Instead of putting Christ at the center of their life and causing Christ to get the glory and the attention, their little squabble, their petty little argument had pushed Jesus out of center stage and now everyone in the church was paying attention to these two ladies who just couldn't get along. And so Paul writes in chapter 2, not just to these two ladies, but certainly he had them in mind. He writes to the whole church some timeless pastoral advice. He says, if you have any encouragement from being united with Christ, if any comfort from his love, if any fellowship with his spirit, if any tenderness and compassion, then make my joy complete by being like-minded, having the same love, being one in spirit and purpose. So Paul starts out his advice by reminding them what Christ had already done for them. Christ had showed his love for them. The Holy Spirit had taken them, uh, the sinners at Corinth, and he had ended the hostility between them and God through Christ, and he brought them close to Christ. Paul makes an appeal to them. He says, make my joy complete. By being like-minded, having the same love, being in one spirit and purpose. For Christ's sake, put aside your petty differences and 
unite around Christ and your mission that you share together. Do it for me, Paul urges. Make my joy complete, he says. Do nothing out of selfish ambition or vain conceit, but in humility consider others better than yourselves. Don't we all need to hear this pastoral advice from time to time? At a time of heightened division and discord in our world, what would happen if we actually put Paul's pastoral advice into practice in our own personal lives? What if, instead of calling those who disagree with you names and insulting the intelligence of those who have ideas different from your own, we stopped in mid-argument and instead, in humility, considered others better than yourselves? Do you see what Paul is driving at here? He is encouraging the believers at Philippi, and especially these two ladies who just can't get along with each other. He is encouraging them that instead of always trying to control the actions of other people, which, by the way, is an effort in futility, instead of trying to get somebody else to do what you want them to do, get them to toe the line, he says, instead, do make a change, not in other people, but make a change in yourself. Because after all, that's the only person you really can change in this world, is yourself. You, you don't have the ability to change other people, but you do have the ability to change yourself, your own attitude. You can't change other people's attitudes, but you can change your own. And so he says, in humility, consider others better than yourself. Be humble. Treat other people as the fellow human beings that they are and not enemies who must be destroyed at all cost. Humility means considering that other people and their ideas might actually be right. And you might be wrong. Humility means considering the fact that other people have possibly found a solution to a problem that you hadn't thought of. These two ladies may have been arguing about who had the best hot dish or how best to run the lady they there at Philippi, we're not told because it's not important. The, the substance of their argument doesn't matter. It was petty, whatever it was. What mattered is that they're arguing they're fighting, their <clears throat> very public disagreement with each other, it was causing shame. It was distracting people away from Christ. And instead of talking about the things that united them, they were knee-deep in the stuff that separated them. What mattered is how they conducted themselves. 
the solution for these two ladies and for the whole church there at Philippi was the same, no matter what the topic of the disagreement. In humility, consider others better than yourself. Each of you should look not only to your own interests, but also to the interests of others. In other words, Paul is saying, you don't always have to be right. You don't always have to get your own way. And I, I know this is hard. I don't know about you, but my sinful nature likes to win. <laughs> whether I'm playing cards with some friends or whether I'm having a disagreement with somebody, I like to come out on top. And in order to win the argument, there are times when I am willing to say things I should not say, and I am willing to have an arrogant attitude that I should not have. I will put down and belittle my opponent, and even issue a few personal jabs meant to do harm, all in an effort to give me the upper hand and the victory. Am I the only one with this problem? Am I the only one who likes to win? Am I the only one who goes too far to argue my point? I think not. What can we do about this problem? And the solution is right here in front of us. In humility, consider others better than yourselves. Each of you should look not only to your own interests, but also to the interests of others. I wonder where Paul got that idea from. I wonder if he... Uh, found it on the pages of popular psychology as he was waiting for his trial back in Rome. I wonder if uh, Oprah or Dr. Phil had a, an hour-long segment on it. Well, I do know where he got the idea from. He says, your attitude should be the same as that of Christ Jesus, who being in very nature of God, did not consider equality with God something to be grasped, but made himself nothing. Taking the very nature of a servant, being made in human likeness, and being found in appearance as a man, he humbled himself and became obedient to death, even death. Where did Paul get the idea about being humble from? About putting other people's interests ahead of your own interests? Of course, he got it from Jesus. Jesus was willing to give up being right all of the time. Who, who was willing to be treated like dirt when he should have been treated like a king? Nothing, and I mean nothing, was beneath him. Jesus was God in human likeness, and yet he was willing to take on the very nature of a servant. By all rights, Jesus should have been waited on hand and foot and treated like the king that he was for all 33 years he was here on this earth, and yet that is not what happened. The disciples should have washed his feet Instead, Jesus was born in a barn, laid in a feeding trough, ridiculed and rejected by the very ones that he had come to save. Jesus allowed his beard to be pulled out, his 
innocent hands to be cuffed, his back to be lashed, his cheek to be spit on, a crown of thorns to be pounded into his scalp. He laid down his divine rights and allowed arrogant soldiers to mock him and cowardly disciples to desert him. And then finally, he hung naked on a cross, taught about humility. Paul put it this way, he humbled himself and became obedient to death, even death on a cross. Ladies of Philippi, men and women of St. Paul's in Neosho, what are you arguing about? Set aside your petty differences, your silly politics, and your short sighted pursuit of earthly goals. And be like-minded. Unite around Jesus. Be like Jesus. Humble yourself like Jesus. And that brings up an interesting point, doesn't it? Well, Jesus was here on earth. He sometimes spoke sharply with those who disagreed with him. Jesus was a frequent and skilled debater. How often don't we find Jesus engaging himself in a very spirited conversation with the teachers of the law? Sometimes they are the ones who start the conversation and sometimes he is the one who starts the conversation. Jesus always went toe to toe with them when the truth was on the line. But here's the difference. Jesus' goal was never to win the argument and to make his opponents look like fools. His goal in each and every argument was to win souls. Not to win the argument, to win souls. Jesus stood up for the truth. And so as Christians, we too can stand up for the truth as long as your attitude is the same as that as Christ Jesus. You can defend the truth as long as your goal isn't to win the argument, but your goal is to win a soul. That's the big difference, of course, between Jesus and his spirited conversations and mine, is that Jesus was a man without sin, and I am not. So, as sinners, we need to check ourselves. Am I engaging in a word battle over some silly reason that distracts people away from Christ? Or am I arguing in such a way that brings even more glory to Christ? When I speak with people, am I speaking with them in such a way that it's very, very clear to them and to anyone else who is listening to that conversation that I consider that other person more important than me? Far too often, I have failed. I daily need to repent. And so do you. Way too many times. 
we have acted in a way that brings shame to Christ and not glory. But brothers and sisters, that is the bad news. But there's good news here too. The good news is that even though you and I have failed so often, Jesus never failed. Not even once. Not a single word came out of his mouth that was wrong. Every word, even though sometimes those words were sharp, were words spoken out of humility, spoken out of an intent to win a soul. Every word he spoke came from the right attitude and he did all of that for you. And he did all of that for me too. So that my salvation doesn't depend upon whether I've always said the right things with the right attitude, but that my salvation depends upon him. The proof is in the pudding. Paul wrote, therefore, God exalted him to the highest place and gave him the name that is above every name, that at the name of Jesus every knee should bow in heaven and on earth and under the earth, and every tongue confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. You see, the proof is in the pudding. God exalted Jesus. That means that he fulfilled what God asked him to do perfectly. He did the perfect life that you and I needed. Jesus did not fail to do the job. And so now, what's left? We are called to get on our knees and to worship Him. There are some things that we must wait to get to heaven before we're going to be able to enjoy them. But there are some things that we can do while we are still here on this earth. And Paul lays them out. He says we can right now praise Him, call Him King of Kings and Lord of and we can use our tongues to confess that Jesus Christ is Lord, yes, even now. And when we do that, when we do that, when we find ourselves so busy praising God for his blessings to us, when we find ourselves so busy confessing to others Christ and what he has done for us, then we won't find ourselves having any time to get involved in silly, pointless squabbles. May God grant it. May each of us strive to more and more make Jesus our all in all, so that God the Father gets all the glory he deserves. May God grant it for Jesus' sake. Amen.